Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us this evening for the final lecture uh, in our annual lecture series, which is hosted in partnership with the German Historical Institute of London. Now I'm delighted that uh, two representatives from the Institute are, are with us here this evening. Um, so, um, Without further ado, it's it's a real honor and a pleasure um, to introduce Dr. Sarah Lightman, who is an accomplished artist, writer, editor, speaker, and curator. Her academic career has spanned a range of prestigious institutions, starting with Central St. Martins, where she took an art foundation course, to the Slade School of Art, where she earned her BA and MFA. She then undertook and was awarded a PhD in women's autobiographical comics from the University of Glasgow. Currently, Dr. Lightman is a faculty member at the Royal Drawing School, where she imparts her knowledge through teaching and workshops, and one imagines inspires the next generation of graphic artists. However, Dr. Lightman has also had a glittering career as an artist and creator of graphic narratives herself. In particular, her 2019 graphic novel, The Book of Sarah, received critical acclaim and was shortlisted for several awards. Dr. Lightman has also co-edited several volumes on Jewish women in comics, which explore the intersection of art, culture, and identity. Furthermore, Dr. Lightman's artwork has appeared in solo and group exhibitions around the globe from London to San Francisco. So it's no exaggeration to say that she is one of the leading figures, if not perhaps the leading figure uh, in women's autobiographical comics. Her career has been adorned with numerous accolades, including the Will Eisner Award, a Jordan Schnitzler Book Award, and grants from esteemed institutions such as the Rothschild Foundation and the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Dr. Lightman is a much sought after speaker and guest lecturer at events and universities worldwide. So it is a genuine privilege to have her here with us this evening, where she will be speaking about redrawing biblical women through comics. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Sarah Lightman. <laughs> I don't quite feel like the person who was introduced, but I am, Sarah Lightman. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, so before I begin, thank you very much, Learbeck Institute and the um, German Historical uh, Inst Society Institute for having me here today. Thank you to Kinga, um, to Karina, Joe, and Ro and Jonathan for all the assistance I've had in making this happen. I also want to say thank you in advance to Kinga because she will be assisting me today with some of the readings for my talk. Um, I also want to give you a trigger warning because I will be showing images of sexual assault. They are part of the work that I will be talking about today. Can women ever win, either in a biblical text or in its literary, musical or visual afterlife? So asks J. Cheryl Exum in her book, Plotted, Shot and Painted, Cultural Representations of Biblical Women. Tonight, I will show you how, in three graphic narratives, women from the Bible are given a second chance to live authentic and uninhibited lives and to express their experiences, however traumatic, in an un un edited manner. The three women artists I present, Sharon Rudel, myself, and Miriam Clayton, challenge patriarchal biblical narratives and imagery and transform them into contemporary feminist living her stories. In this lecture, I will follow 
the order of the three biblical women in their original chron chronology. Sharon Rudel in the Star Sapphire releases Eve. In Genesis, Eve was exiled and punished for striving for autonomy and intellectual growth. In the Star Sapphire, she finds a life of community and autonomy in a coming of age narrative set in 1970s New York. In the book of Sarah, I draw my struggles to birth and breastfeed my son, where Sarah the matriarch's postpartum struggles are glossed over in favor of a celebration of the creation of the male line in Jewish history after the birth of her son, Isaac. And finally, Miriam Katyn in We Are On Our Own draws the multiple rapes of her mother on the run in Hungary during the Holocaust, in contrast to Queen Esther in The Scroll of Esther, whose marital rapes are ignored in a society where se the sexual abuse of women is rampant. Before we begin, let me tell you how I fell into this re research. The Bible stories I learned as a child edged out women. Women birth nations, run homes, but the complexities of their lives were glossed over and mostly insignificant. Through my academic journey, I needed to revise my understanding of the Bible of my childhood. I needed to have those familiar stories resonate with my own adult life and creative journey. As an artist, I discovered the world of comics after my MFA at the Slade School of Art just down the road from here. It didn't take long to see that the world of Jewish comics was also a sexist affair. I visited the touring exhibition Superman and the Rabbi's Cat, Comics and Jewish Memory, in 2007 when it opened at the Jewish Museum in Paris. Note that both comics and the title were written by male comics artists. I saw an impressive exhibition that traced the history of Jews and comics, but almost predictably, most of the exhibitors were men, including Art Spiegelman, Will Eisner and Ben Katcher. I attended a symposium about comics in New York. All the other panels were filled with male comic artists who were given over an hour for their discussions. But there was a very crowded lineup for women's autobiographical comics. In total, four female comics artists were squeezed into a 45 minute session. It's no coincidence then that three years later in 2010, I co-curated an exhibition, Graphic Details, Confessional Comics by Jewish Women. It was the first exhibition ever to focus on the contribution Jewish women had made to the world of autobiographical comics. The tour opened in San Francisco and visited nine museums over six years, with tens of thousands of visitors. It featured 18 artists, including Sharon Rudel and, Trina Ro and, and, and Miriam Caton and myself. In 2019, I edited Graphic Details, Jewish Women's Confessional Comics and Essays and Interviews, the first ever book on Jewish women and comics, featuring all the artists in the exhibition and an opportunity for the artworks to be accessed long after the show had ceased to tour. For example, the star Sapphire, which I discussed tonight, is reproduced in full in this book. Just before we look at the comics tonight, I'm aware that some of my audience may not be familiar with looking at graphic narratives. And here I mean not just reading the words, but also seeing how the, the images work. I suggest looking at how these stories are told, the line drawn, the way space and shape are presented. These are all narrative devices that give added layers of meaning and atmosphere to the story. Look at the speech bubbles and thought bubbles and all the other tropes of comics and see what they contribute. Let's now turn to Sharon Rudel, a Jewish American comics artist, and one of the female artists who contributed to the first underground comics publications of the 1970s. She was part of a collective that started women's comics and, oops, and her subsequent publications include A Dangerous Woman, the graphic biography of Emma Goldman, as well as A Ballad of an American, a graphic biography of Paul Robeson, and she recently wrote the text for the book, The Bund, a graphic history of Jewish labor resistance. In the star sapphire, young Sharon is drawn as she leaves home and the shelter of parental authority, enjoys sexual freedom, embraces autonomy, and finds and builds a new community. We also meet the unimpressive young man she falls in love with, gets engaged to, and finally divorces. This is the opening panel where Sharon is in a Salvation Army store. 
She has lost the star sapphire, star sapphire stone from her engagement ring, which then later becomes her wedding ring. This choice of shop is significant and symbolic, and the drawn objects around her are rich with associations, all of which reflect histories that will be examined and disregarded. As we shall see, this is especially evident in Rudel's revision of patriarchal readings of Eve. On the third page of the Star Sapphire, we see our exhausted protagonist, Sharon, and her fiance, desperate to get married before their marriage license runs out. In this crucial panel, the synagogue entrance has a misspelled Shalom Alechem in Hebrew. The correct spelling translates as peace be upon you, an inclusive and welcoming sign. The misspelling introduces us instead to an unwelcoming space with the two pointing and bearded rabbis, figure, rabbinic figures, expelling the young couple from the synagogue. The couple enact Masaccio's image of a silent Adam and Eve being banished from Eden in the expulsion from the Garden of Eden from the Brancacci Chapel inside the Church of Santa Maria del Carmen in Florence. This is a there is a significant discrepancy between the two images of the heroine, where Masaccio's Eve is naked, in Rudel's version, Sharon, Eve, is clothed, but is dressing Eve the only aspect of Eve that is revised? Today we will look at one way that Rudel gives biblical Eve a chance to win through the narrative of a star sapphire. In an important edited collection of essays on Jewish feminism, Yentl's Revenge, Yiska Rosenfeld, in her essay, You Take Lilith, I'll Take Eve, notes that the biblical narrative of Eve demarcates a distinct relationship with language. It is a very familiar voice for many women, the voice of not having a voice. Ultimately, Eve's story is a story about speech. Rosenfeld notes that God speaks directly to Adam in Genesis, and Adam names all the animals. In contrast, Eve is named by others, and neither God nor Adam speak to her directly making Eve initially a silent and absent figure. A Midrash is an ancient commentary on the five books of Moses. And here is a Midrash from Genesis Rabbah that expands on Adam's act of naming. God asked him, and you, what is your name? He replied, the name Adam fits me. God asked why? He replied, because I was fashioned out of the earth, Adama. God asked, and I, what is my name? The name Lord Adonai fits you. God asked, why? Because you are Lord over all your works. Rosenfeld comments. It is clear that God is enjoying the conversation and teasing out Adam's intellectual and creative processes. The tone is playful, but also incredibly empowering. To be asked by God for your opinions, to be entrusted to help complete creation. And Eve missed the whole thing. Rosenfeld argues that it is unsurprising that the snake first approaches, approaches Eve with the apple, since Eve would have been desperate for conversation. Mm -hmm. Having heard God and Adam speak all around her, the first direct speech she encounters is the snake's, and he is the recipient of her first words. As Rosenfeld reflects, I can't help but think how thrilling it must have been for Eve to have someone approach her and ask her a simple question. Imagine the beauty and irresistibility of a right round question to an independent thinking person who has never been asked before to voice her opinion on anything, to assess information or to make a decision. We shall now see how in the Star Sapphire, Sharon's journey to adulthood can be traced through her journey from silence to speaking, as well as her use of gendered language. Rudel uses the format of comics, including speech bubbles and thought bubbles, to present Sharon finding a voice and a language of her own in contrast to her silent biblical predecessor. Notably, there is a significant discrepancy between what we see of Sharon and what we hear of her at the beginning of the comic. Throughout the first page of the comic, and not including the thrift shop scenes that bracket the past, when young and in love, Sharon does not speak at all. She is described instead as a girl going to art school in the big city. The words girl and big city heighten her precarious and vulnerable existence in a space that overwhelms her. 
Sharon is drawn naked, semi-naked and silent when spoken to by her mother. On the next page, Sharon is shown with her mother and she parrots her delighted response to the engagement ring. Back home in the Lower East Side, when her fiancé delays the wedding date, she does not respond. Then we have two incidents where she communicates through thought bubbles. Firstly, when she is shown looking out of the window surveying her options, if he doesn't marry me, and in response to her boyfriend's proposal, when she again only thinks and does not say her response, he really loves me. It is only on the third page that we hear Sharon speak when she says, come on, the Unitarians have to marry us, they're no liberals. The next direct speech is to her fiance outside the synagogue. Listen, I'm a Jewish girl in trouble who wants to become an honest woman. How can they refuse me? Sharon finally finds a priest to carry out their marriage, but it is portrayed as, but is portrayed as silent during a secular marriage ceremony, as is the way in traditional Jewish weddings. Sharon has only thought bubbles in the scene in the kitchen after the marriage has taken place. The next direct speech we encounter is in the present again, at the charity shop, and then finally in the scene at the commune supper table. Sharon's voice here is very different than it was in the past. We have a woman clearly articulating what she wants and what matters to her. I think I will buy this trunk. And you sure do cook good chicken, Ed. In her essay, The Laugh of the Medusa, Hélène Sixus deliberates on women's relationship to writing and power using bodily metaphors and images that are pertinent to women's experiences. Sixus describes how women's writing is like good mother's milk. She writes in white ink. This image suggests that the invisibility of women's writing and voices portrayed through, is portrayed through her own bodily experiences. Good mother's milk connects to a generationally embedded repression that is intrinsic in the nourishing and sustenance of the child. In the star Sapphire, Sharon moves from speaking in white on white to speaking in black on white, written in a black and white comic, moving away from the attachment to the mother from the good mother's milk. Sharon opens with her white, her white milk writing through her silence, her childlike intonation with her conversation with her mother. Her speech is littered with associations that reflect an immaturity, maturity, notably her exclamation of infatuation with her new jewellery. Look how it sparkles, Ma. She calls her mother a childlike name, Ma, emphasising the power relationship at play, and her comparison of a stone to a star is reminiscent of the nursery rhyme, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Sharon's developing maturity from white ink to black ink can be traced from a tentative and still veiled association of self outside the synagogue to an emphatic will written in bold black ink on a white page when she decides to buy the thrift shop chest for her comics. Sharon manifests another crisis of verbal power outside the synagogue through her imitation of the language of the rabbis, the language of fathers and patriarchal authority as she speaks of herself, as they would have spoken of, of her. In the first sequence, when she speaks the word I, when previously she'd only thought the word I, she also simultaneously disparages her own objectified self. The linguistic tension reflects how Sharon is not yet asserting her own voice or identity, but is parroting cultural and religious teachings. Jewish girl, in trouble, honest woman. The choice of words suggests that before one is married, one is a girl, and afterwards, through approved sexual relations within marriage and no other achievement, one becomes a woman. In addition, the religious language is one of shame, in trouble, versus honest woman, suggests a woman's sexuality and sexual experience, change her classifications and diminish her value. Six notes, notes that for women, her words almost always fall upon the deaf male ear but she has a language only that which speaks in the masculine. Sharon attempts to speak in the masculine, but is confronted by the deaf male ear, belonging to a fiancé and the rabbis. She is ignored and her words diminish. Significantly, it is the first time she speaks for herself as an I outside the synagogue. Yet she opens her sentence with listen, as if expecting to be overlooked. The word is also a reminder even to herself that she is indeed speaking. The only dialogue Sharon encounters is much later in the comic, in the present, 
with the woman in the thrift shop and the group in the commune. In contrast to Eve's silence during the comic, Sharon's individual growth can be traced linguistically from a silenced or ignored voice to a voice impersonating others' opinions and values, and finally to one that converses directly on her own terms. We leave Sharon in her commune eating supper, talking about cartoonist's union, a political event she will, event, she, event she will attend. If the stone that fell from her ring was a circle, so is the space subsequently found to replace the world Sharon leaves behind. The star Sapphire concludes with a new community different from the traditional Jewish home and Orthodox synagogue, both male-led, that also disempowered her. Food and meals are central to Jewish traditional life, and even though the commune is a secular space, the image resonates with a religious tradition, like a pseudo-Sabbath meal, where everyone, children and adults, joins together to eat. This scene is also the summation of Rudel's reversal of Eve's narrative. Where Eve offers her apple to Adam, Sharon is offered food by a male housemate. Where Eve is damned for her actions and for sharing her apple with Adam, Sharon thanks Ed. Where Eve is maligned, dismissed and cursed, Sharon inhabits the space of being valued, the star within the ring of her comic, a paradise found. We now move to my own work. I could never have achieved the Book of Sarah without the works of Miriam Caton and Sharon Rudel. The Book of Sarah, having the Book of Sarah out in the world has been a marvelous experience that has also made me vulnerable. I sometimes cannot bear to look at the pages to remind myself what I've written about. And yet at the same time, it helps me know I exist in the world. Look, a book about me, by me. Sometimes I'm afraid of how much people know about me even before they've met me. The Book of Sarah traces my life from childhood through moving out of my parents' home, relationships, marriage, and motherhood. But it's different from the comics we discussed today because it was an ongoing art project began in 1995 when I was a student at the Slade. I created thousands of diary drawings, sketched in hundreds of books as I was living the experiences I recorded. When I drew from my childhood, I used family photographs. I also made artworks from charcoal, watercolor, and oil paint. The Book of Sarah is a reckoning with a Judaism I grew up with and the modern orthodoxy I adopted as a teenager. I wanted to find my voice and making my drawings helped me do this. During my first year at the Slade as an anxious and excited undergraduate, I attended a three-day print workshop. I decided on the spot to create my own Bible, the Hampstead Bible. It opened with the Book of Sarah. I was an observant Jew at the time and was immersed in Talmud Torah, Jewish learning. Every morning I would recite my morning prayers and then read a passage from the weekly portion of the Torah that we read at synagogue that week before I arrived at art school. I would record my pencil comments and questions in the margins and columns of the pages. As I did this, I also had the sense of wanting my thoughts no longer to take this literally marginalized position. In the Hampstead Bible, I was to become a female textual and visual commentator on my own story, a female figure entirely absent to me during all my previous Jewish education. I was making a bridge between my Jewish life and knowledge and the experiences I was having as a modern woman in the world. Again, in the collection Yentl's Revenge, social worker and journalist Jennifer Blair describes her journey from Riot Girl to Yeshiva Girl in her article of that title, as she reflects on her journey from feminist punk through a period of intense involvement in Orthodox Hasidic Judaism in Israel. Blair writes that she now sees Judaism as something essentially beautiful that has been hijacked by a great many self-appointed authorities. As sacrilegious as it sounds, the rabbis need their own fuck you in order to liberate the treasures they guard. For me, this liberation occurred through art, a cautious fuck you to the rabbinic authorities I lived amongst in Northwest London. The Hampstead Bible used art to create a space where my voice and views could be heard uncontested, unlike in the religious circles that I belonged to, where women were still asking male authorities for permission to be rabbis and to give sermons in synagogues. I was committed to a level of authenticity in this subversion, and I used a font that was gothic on thin, lightweight, and aptly named Bible paper. In the opening pages of the Book of Sarah, my graphic novel, I redrew these pages of the Hampstead Bible. I took this approach to ensure that my own pencil comments and interpretations on the side of my Bible text, which I had read in the morning years ago, now took center stage on my art. The Book of Sarah, one one, the life of Sarah. 
the life of Sarah. And these were the days of the life of Sarah when she reached her 23rd year. The life of Sarah, the life of Sarah, that is the book of Sarah. The life of Sarah, and they said to her, there is no book of Sarah, but there is, is there not a book of Esther and a book of Daniel, she asked. And they said, but you have a whole section in the Torah named after you, and the Torah is holier than the writings of the prophets. But still she demanded a book of Sarah. In this text, I include voices of commentators who both dismiss and support why I needed a book of my own. My demands were a feminist statement and an act of sibling rivalry. My brother and sister, Esther and Daniel, had their own literature in the Bible, the scroll of Esther and the book of Daniel respectively, but I did not. My work continues as a commentary on and response to the matriarch, Sarah. We were both older mothers. She was 100 and I was 39 when we had our only sons. After women from the Bible give birth, they never seem to discuss how hard early motherhood is. It seemed to me that women's experiences were edited out to benefit the celebratory narrative of male progeny and family lines. I wanted to discuss my own ambivalence about birth and motherhood in contrast to what we learn of matriarch Sarah's experience. She is presented as delighted after giving birth to Isaac and consumed with joy and laughter. When her son is born, she says, God has made me laugh and everyone who hears of this will laugh with me. Meanwhile, I was uncomfortable after the cesarean and shell-shocked by my own responsibilities, and my body seemed to refuse to respond as I needed it to. Laughter was the furthest thing from my mind, but others kept forcing happiness upon me. I drew a visit from the midwife. Smile, said the midwife. You have a beautiful skull. My body is admired, a product of medical expertise, and, I am told, a reason to lighten my emotional state. The next image is my bloated stomach, where my caesarean scar can be seen tipped up slightly at the corners like a sinister smile. And I betray how I'm feeling about my body. How would I know? I cannot bear to see what they have done to me. Even though my son's birth was a planned caesarean, I was uncomfortable learning and then seeing the results of all the medical procedures that took place when I could not see or feel my own body. I also experienced the dichotomy between how I felt and Harry's own experiences as a newborn. You sleep, I can hardly make the tiredness, my aching breasts, your happy face. The words tell of my struggle to keep myself together, capturing the traumatic bodily experience, my fracturing sense of identity, the exhaustion and responsibilities. I was determined to celebrate and recognize my mothering efforts and milestones. Abraham threw a weaning party for Isaac in Genesis. Sarah's absence at this moment is glaring, as I presume she'd been doing all the work, namely breastfeeding and nurturing her son. The text in Genesis reads, The child grew and was weaned, and on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. On June 23rd, 2014, to celebrate the introduction of solids, all Harry, my son's grandparents, gathered in the garden. Six months old, you planted a cherry tree. Surrounded by your mummy and daddy and all your grandparents, we fed you pureed carrot. You spat it out. My thoughts were that I had fed my son on my own for six months, and now, before he ate directly from the earth and her fruits, we would give her a gift. The act was a benediction and a consecration, where I'd previous where I created a language of thanksgiving years after I used to say Hebrew prayers regularly. I wish my son would continue to grow now that he would eat solids, but that he would also take care of the earth in return. Most importantly, I created a ritual of my own and was no longer tied to the rituals I'd grown up with. Here we have an image from the book of Sarah. I drew Rembrandt's etching and dry point, Abraham entertaining the angels. The angels are portrayed visiting the elderly couple. And the focus is on Abraham serving the food, while Sarah appears shadowed within the arched doors of the building, as her fertility and future child are discussed in her virtual absence. I wrote, Sarah, Sarah, come out the shadows. This is your life. This is your time. A call for ownership of life and body, an aspiration and hope for me to strive towards a more autonomous and authentic life. My final example is Miriam Caton. We Are On Our Own is a graphic novel first published by Jordan Quarterly in 2006. It is a Holocaust memoir that focuses on one year of the author's childhood in Hungary that was spent in hiding and on the run. 
We Are On Our Own has traveled worldwide, having been translated into French, Spanish, German, Swedish, Korean, and Polish. I want to add here that I find the work challenging, but a necessary comic to discuss, given the atrocity that happened in Israel on October the 7th, where the sexual abuse of women was used as a weapon of war, and there's been little international outcry. We Are On Our Own is described as a memoir, yet I always wondered why Katie had chosen not to use her and her mother's given names in the book. Why did her mother have the name Esther? I made the connection between We Are On Our Own and the scroll of Esther, and I was on a tube on the way to the British Library a week after Purim, the festival when this scroll is read. I was off to research other Holocaust literature by hidden children, and it struck me that this story was a contemporized Purim story, a redemptive narrative filled with female heroism, denial of faith, biblioclasm, thwarted genocide and sexual assault. The Scroll of Esther, also known as the Megillah of Esther, is a biblical text written about Queen Esther, a hidden Jewess who foiled a, ma foiled a massacre of the Jews in Persia in 483 to 482 BCE. Esther was forced to become a concubine then wife to King Ashverosh and to hide her faith and family. And in the course of a narrative, she faces rape and death. In We Are On Our Own, Esther Levy and her daughter survive by living as hidden Jews under new identities given to them by a black marketeer. The story follows them during the Nazi invasion of Hungary in 1944, the institution of anti-Jewish legislation, and the gathering up of Hungarian Jews for deportation to Auschwitz. In We Are On Our Own, the quick thinking and resourcefulness of Esther Levy enabled them to survive, avoiding the fate of approximately 606,000 Hungarian Jews who were killed. But the mother and daughter do not escape unscathed. Esther Levy is raped multiple times by an unnamed Nazi officer and later is victim of the mass rapes of the Red Army. Young Lisa is exposed to numerous incidents of violence and terror and even witnesses the mass rape herself. But as in the Purim story, there is a miracle of survival and we are on our own. Esther and Lisa survive the war and are reunited with Carolee, Esther's husband and Lisa's father. The family return home to Budapest, from which they all later moved to Israel via New York. The graphic novel is also a story of lingering trauma and PTSD, but I will not have time to discuss that aspect today. Caton's graphic novel focuses on two women's Holocaust experiences and memories, with the father having a very reduced role and presence. This contrasts with Mouse by Art Spiegelman, another retelling of parental Holocaust trauma by a child. Art's father destroys the mother's diaries. Not only is there no female-led narrative, but this absence was created by a man entrusted with preserving her voice. However, even though Caden has produced a visually and textually articulate and graphic graphic novel, it is Lisa the child and not Esther the mother who narrates the story of the two episodes of sexual abuse the latter endured. Queen Esther is equally silent about her sexual abuse in the scroll of Esther, which is littered with consistently unchallenged incidences of sexual abuse, marital rape, and other forced sexual relations. Feminist biblical scholars have noted the text's lack of judgment regarding the abuse, of abuse in the story and Esther's suffering. Shulamit Reinhardt writes, Esther seems to have accepted or have been unable to question the king's practice of sexually enslaving women. Esther was right to be cautious of the king, Biblical commentators note her predecessor, the former queen, Queen Vashti, refused to expose herself naked to the king's guest, and for this crime was banished, and some sources say she was beheaded. The Talmud, a central text of rabbinic Judaism, reveals that Esther's relationship with Hashverosh was not a romantic one, and she repeated, remained passive and allowed the king to rape her repeatedly. The story of Queen Esther seems to suggest that her sexual submission to the king in the form of this marital rape has a greater purpose. Mordecai, her uncle, asks, who knows if it's not just for such a time, this proposed destruction of the Jews, that you reach this royal position. Esther is only able to thwart these plans because she has submitted herself to the king's sexual demands. In We Are On Our Own, Esther Levy's relationship with a Nazi officer bears many similarities to that of Queen Esther and King Hashverosh. Esther and Lisa are living as hidden Jews in a farmhouse when a visiting commandant, German commandant, appears. As we have seen with marital rape, the abuse that occurs between Esther and the officer can be construed as a lesser crime. As Caden stated to me in an email, 
when you read the story, you can see that there was no re, as I've seen, by the Nazi. Not that way, really. Coercion was the way it went. I guess, I guess rape is stronger, but it was not rape. In this context, her spelling error is significant, an unconscious textual refusal to name and identify the act. However, I argue it was rape, as described by feminist trauma theoreticians, including Susan Brown Miller, who describes rape as a crime not of lust, but of violence and power. Let us now apply some visual analysis to support my argument and see how comics can uniquely portray power and abuse through what is shown and what is hidden from the viewer. In this scene in the courtyard, Caton focuses on gaze as an expression of power with two panels that are interrupted by the leering face of the commandant. This face overrides the panels as it overrules and interrupts the temporary peace and order in the lives of the mother and daughter. Caton has visualized the power setup within the relationship. While Lisa looks directly up at the officer, the mother looks away in a sinister silent ballet of looks and unspoken exchanges. The child does not understand what is happening and is unperturbed when the Nazi officer, uninvited, strokes her chin, a touch that can be used read as a preamble to his touching of Esther. During another visit by the commandant, he addresses Esther by way of Lisa saying, Now I must talk to your mother. I have some questions. Is there a room where we can be alone? Of course, the officer's use of the word questions would be terrifying to Esther, since these questions would swiftly uncover her Jewish identity. The officer is then seen maneuvering the mother into a room. The next scene is a hidden scene, and the exact sexual encounter is unseen. Esther Levy does not struggle as she is led into the bedroom by the officer, but this woman also knows that to fight back would endanger herself and her daughter. This unseen scene is portrayed through the gutter and page itself. The viewer is left to imagine what happened. This is an example of Scott McLeod's discussion of closure, when a viewer fills in a transition between two panels to complete the narrative and comprehends the action and meaning between two seemingly discrete panels. In addition, the drawn open door through which the officer leads Esther Levy acts as an internal barrier between the viewer and the characters. It is not just the gutter space on the page and the door itself that confront the viewer as Esther is led away by the officer, but also the necessity of turning the page itself. Our page turning highlights how we cannot reach Esther or save her. She is very much on her own. And so, instead of drawing Esther in the bedroom, the focus is now upon Lisa. The officer has bought a box of chocolates for her to eat as a distraction from the separation from her mother. And now Lisa can be found on the subsequent page obliviously enjoying her chocolate, entranced by her own sensual delights. After another visit, the officer leaves. Le officer leaves. Lisa returns to her mother in the bedroom and asks why she is so sad, since she thinks of the officer as a wonderful man who gives her chocolate. The mother is silently crying, hiding her pain, shame and abuse from the child. It then becomes clearer why Caton, and now adult Elisa, might deny the extent of her mother's abuse by the Nazi, but still draw her mother's devastation. Lisa experienced the abuse through the chocolate treats and her mother's silence. In addition, there was also the pseudo-normative attitude of a Nazi officer to Esther, the setting of the rape in Esther's bedroom on her bed, and the lack of any sign of forced violation, and the officer's gifts, including silk stockings. There are more images of rape than we are on our own. Notably, drawings of a mass rape by the Red Army that show all the victims' fear and naked vulnerability, including Esther's and Lisa's. One woman is drawn on a knee of a soldier. She covers her eyes and her breasts are exposed as he touches her body. On the floor, a naked older woman has a bottle jammed into her mouth. The drawing of a crowd scene makes it difficult to identify individuals, mirroring the abuse that reduced women to bodies and wore booty. It is hard to find Esther and Lisa in this confusion. Is Esther crying out, take me to protect Lisa or is it some other woman and child? Women are humiliated and drawn during their abuse. The Russian assault shows a world of chaos, fear and destruction, devoid of empathy and compassion. Caitlin's depiction of these scenes is significant within the field of art history. Ray part in classical paintings is often disturbingly celebratory. For example, in Nicolas Poussin's Technicolor Carnival, Abduction of a Sabine Women, 
The colours are strong, the composition complex, but the women are merely bodies to be grabbed within the grand and dramatic theatre of Asian history. But Katyn names her favourite artist as Katy Kollwitz. Kollwitz was a German artist who lost a son and grandson through war, and whose work often focused on the suffering and tragedy inflicted by conflict. In Rapes, the artist confronts the after effects of rape head on with a figuration that looks away. Marta Kearns, author of Katy Kollwitz, Woman and Artist, describes how Rape is one of the earliest pictures in Western art to depict a female victim of sexual violence sympathetically and from a woman's point of view. In Colwitz's print, Rapes, unlike the painting by Poussin, we see a woman after she's been raped and she lies on the ground, her attack is long gone. We do not see her face and cannot identify her. She has become a broken body and it's ambiguous whether she is alive or dead. We can assume this woman has experienced extreme intimate violence in the hand of men. Here nature covers her battered body, giving respect back to the person. In the same way that Colwitz does not draw the preceding events, leaving them to the viewer to imagine, Esther Levy's abuse at the hands of a Nazi officer is not shown, and we read, we read Esther's experiences in the after images. Esther Levy is quietly weeping on her bed, the shattering impact of rape on a victim. And in contrast to the glorious soldiers of Poussin's painting, the Russian soldiers liberating Hungary from the Nazis are not heroes. Instead, they are portrayed as drunk and dangerous fools. Rudel, Caton and I borrow previously created artworks by male artists, adapting visual tropes and reusing them. We three comics artists bring these biblical women out from the darkened, frightened positions in the archways of biblical misogyny and from the shadows of art history, from the words on the page where the Bible is silent, where they are finally, and I argue, argue magnificently, able to win on these comics pages. However, in the aftermath of October the 7th, winning in this way seems small consolation. We are on our own as not an isolated historical event. There are devastating descriptions of atrocities that occurred in Israel on October the 7th, an arrested Hamas terrorist is quoted as saying they were given permission to rape women living and dead. There is evidence of mass rape of women, grandmothers and children so violent they broke their victims' pelvises. I refuse to show images of women who've been brutalized that are on the web, but from the silence of United Nations women and other organizations, it seems here again the violent sexual abuse of women, specifically Jewish women in this case, has been overlooked and ignored. What can art do in the face of these atrocities in the world's silence? Even today, as I was rereading this text, I was thinking that Caton took around 50 years to publish her own childhood experiences as a toddler on the run in the, in, in the Holocaust. What are those traumas experienced by those young is, Israeli hostages, toddlers, even babies, some of who have been released and some who are still in captivity? What have they witnessed and how will their experiences haunt them? There is no answer to my questions, but I've seen Israeli artists begin to use art as a form of witnessing and memory. I will end today's talk on a website that Israeli illustrators have used to memorialize the dead and missing from October the 7th. Here again, art can stand in for silence and what has not yet been spoken. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for this uh, fascinating and also visceral talk, which raises so many questions. Um, we'll take questions from the from the room, from those present, but also if you're watching this online, you can pop your question in the chat and we will we will read them out as we go through. So are there any questions to begin with from anybody in the audience? Can I have two questions? <coughs> I, I, oh, King has got a question. question. Um, I hope we can take them. Oh, yes, I'll just keep it in. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the responses to um, the comics you talked about, both your own, but also um, on the other artists you, you talk about. Um, what does the audience say? How do they react to these works? I don't know. What do you say? Rather, no, you like the comics? You found them powerful, the things you saw? What did you say? I know Laura, so I can ask her. Um, yeah, I mean, I obviously I love your work. <laughs> Great color of your work. I, I, I don't, don't know the other two. 
Um, I think you talked about them in the graphic narrative um, course that I did that you run. Um, I mean, I just love the sort of the playfulness, but also the confronting of the difficult issues and it all wrapped up together. And I think that's what's so amazing about kind of cartoon and graphic work is that often it's about really serious subjects and yet it's in this very accessible, often using amazing humour. And so it, it kind of presents those subjects in a, in a way that's often easier, in inverted commas, or more accessible for people. Um, or at least it's just presented in a different way than perhaps reading an academic text or historical account. Um, so yeah, I mean, I've come to this quite late, to be honest. Um, I, my husband reads comics and I, I didn't really know this history of women's comics until fairly recently. So, and I think that's one of the issues, like you say, there's this history that isn't known enough. And I know like Henny Bone once was an amazing cartoonist that I've worked with quite a lot recently. And, she does amazing work and she's always posting when there are awards and stuff that there are so few, she does more political content, there are so few women that are often put up for these prizes and it's still a very dominated sphere, I think, by, by men. So yeah, I think it's really important that we know about this work. Sorry, a bit of a but I think <laughs> I think what I feel often people have, and I'm sure this is also what you're saying, is that people are quite surprised what a comic can do. You can read it as a story, and then suddenly if you start reading it as an image and a story, there's a whole extra side going on. If you start reading the circle as part of the story, if you start reading the fact that there's a black background and they're going, you know, they're going into the light or they're going away from the light, that tells you something else. It's um, when I teach, I often get the comics. You know, I had. Kinga, who did a wonderful job today, I got Kinga to work with me, but often I get people to, to, to read out the comics because they're quite a performative art form. And I think you get to appreciate them kind of as a theatre on the screen or in the book once they're read out as well. So that helps people know how rich just the page of comics really is. I noticed that in these stories, these different stories, they're all feminist stories, but they all have um, a very strong emphasis on violence against the body and bodily experience. So that might be a misinterpretation because I don't know the entirety of the plot. <laughs> and you have maybe chosen these examples, but is there a reason that it is particular the ways that bodies are violated that are in the foreground? I I suppose really I'm very interested in women's stories that aren't normally told and this in a form of a sexual assault that's one aspect because there's all that shame and all these other things that happen but also those kind of things that women think of as every day for example there's some wonderful comics about miscarriages but many women when they have a miscarriage think they're the first person they don't it's it's, it's not like a kind of like a currency out there I think that the more we see comics and read comics about various parts of women's bodily experiences, the more you understand you're part of this kind of big community going on. So I think in some ways, comics are a wonderful way to break those boundaries that we might have within our, ourselves or within our own experiences and see that we're part of this kind of more human experience. Mm -hmm. I guess, and I do choose feminist comics for that reason. But one of the reasons is because I'm looking for stories that say things that I didn't learn when I was younger and that I want to know about. Did you like comics? Yeah, what I saw. <laughs> and have you had familiar relationships? Do you know many comics or were these quite new to you? I know Mouse, that's all. Right, because see, what you would do is you would read Mouse and you think, well, that's Holocaust War, and then you wouldn't even realize that there are hardly any women in it and women's experience don't exist and there isn't a voice and actually, suddenly you realise, oh my goodness, and then Miriam Caton comes and I think, my goodness, that was what a woman experienced during the war. There's some, um, lots, there are a number of uh, Holocaust memoirs out there by women or, or women writing about their parents' Holocaust memoirs, and I think it's really important that we don't think there's a canon, and that's it, and we put a, put a fence around mouse and don't realise there's this whole other library out there. I'd be willing to give people some names if they'd like them. <laughs> We have a, yeah, oh, I can, yeah. 
Uh, we have a couple of questions um, on from the Zoom audience. Uh, Nina says, how do your family do your works? Are they comfortable with the stories you tell? Probably not, no. <laughs> but I think there's a stage in your life where you just know you have to tell a story. And every story is quite one's own experience. So there isn't really a truth, is there? It's how you feel it was. And um, I think that's important. I think I could tell you that Miriam Caton, she, her mother didn't want her to write the story. She was worried the people who, who attacked them in the past would come back and get them, even though it was 40 years later and they lived in a different country. Um, so from what I recall, Miriam said, she told her mother about the book when the proofs were with the publisher. So I think there's an, you have to tell a story, but you're not, she's not being her mother. She's telling her own story of what she, you know, thinks happened or heard happened or they discussed about. Um, I think, again, it probably had the feminist um, position was that if you, you, your story matters. And if someone intimates that your, your story isn't valuable, maybe you, you shouldn't listen to it. I haven't seen the exhibition yet take pressure on the women in revolt, so but um, I just want to ask you how do you kind of see yourself and other kind of um, graphic novel artists in the wider context of, of kind of feminist art since the 1970s or 60s or so on? Do you regard yourself as part of that kind of bigger movement which kind of transcends boundaries of Jewish? Um, Topics or so, or is it if your emphasis more on the kind of the Jewish side of, 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 of female existence? And, and Are you saying for me and my research and the things well, that I do? Yes, in your research, but also for you as an artist. So, yes, yeah, so I, I think I definitely explore my Jewish identity. That's a big part of what I did, and that's why I did the, the graphic details exhibition. But one of the artists in the exhibition at the Tate is called Bobby Baker, and she's actually one of the chapters of my PhD. She did a series of diary drawings when she was um, finding life very difficult and was diagnosed by doctors with various things. And she drew a diary drawing a day and they form, I consider a, a kind of form of graphic narrative. And I talk about her work and she isn't Jewish at all, but um, I talk about her as redrawing images of Mary and Jesus through her work. Um, so um, I think, I guess the whole women's art movement um, includes comics as well. It they may not be included in a Tate exhibition, but they could well be. Or they could, you know, works could be included there as art, but they could also be considered to be graphic narratives. It wouldn't. I don't think we have to worry about definitions. I think worrying about um, boundaries and definitions is probably less interesting than the work itself. Um, just to Judith Margolis uh, watching on Zoom, said, I'd like to ask a question. Um, I don't know if you mean through audio or if you'd like to type it, but um, can I can I speak? It. Can I be whole? Her? If you'd like to speak, I would like to. Can I be heard? I can't tell. I think you need to put volume up oh, here. Yes. Is that volume? That, that might be. Okay. So first of all, hello, Sarah. It's oh, been a long time since I've seen you. We can just try to hear you. If, if you give us the moment, we'll, we'll um, okay, great. try and get the... <laughs> try again. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Hello, Sarah. Hello. Um, I w I'm very much touched by what you're saying, of course. When I was nine and I dressed up as Vashti for my Purim celebration at the synagogue in New Jersey where I was being raised. I remember hearing the story and thinking, well, the, she she's right. She didn't want to be naked in front of these people. And yet, in a, even though there was a context of being taught modesty, the person who was claiming to be modest was shamed. And there's a second part in the, in the story of Purim where somebody says, don't let everybody know what she did because the wives won't respect their husbands then. And it was like a little lesson in feminism buried in that story. So when the uh, synagogue people took a picture of all the kids posing, I was not allowed to um, be in that picture. I had taken my mother's pointy 1950s bra and sold be beads on it and basically been what I thought Vashti might have done. 
Um, the fact that you're being able to tell this now, I feel like it's taken so terribly long for these stories to be told the way they are. And I'm very grateful that you uh, are putting it forward and that there should be more and more stories like this. Thank you very much. Like the image of you in this bra is uh, filling my imagination in a purely appropriate manner. But I was also thinking, um, I'll put the volume down. Um, I was thinking, um, you've seen the musical six when it's all Henry VIII's ex-wives. They should have like, you know, all these kind of abusive biblical men. You know, why it's having their moment. You know, because um, w w the stories we're told are only the stories that they want us to focus on. And there's a lot, probably a lot of archaeology that could go on that could uh, recover, like Vashti, some kind of rebellious women. Uh, that would be quite inspiring. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Anyone else? I was going to ask you to talk a little bit about some of the drawings you're doing and putting the biblical women into <laughs> Yeah, so I'm doing this new series. Well, I was in it since COVID, so I got very grumpy because I was doing too many domestic chores and everyone was at home and I had to clean, cook and tidy and give up all my own work to enable homeschooling and everything else. And, you know, we couldn't get any other people in to help us with domestic chores, so I got very angry. And so I started to take women from famous master paintings and put them in my kitchen. So Salome is cooking dinner. And um, Bathsheba isn't, you know, she's, has, she, you know, she's having a bath, but actually she's in my sink with all my dirty dishes. Mm -hmm. And it was a way of saying, look, I can't get to the galleries because they're closed. I can't really even make art properly. Um, but I want to say that I'd like, you know, I, I want these women to escape these paintings and have full lives, but actually they've got to do exactly what I've got to do, which is cleaning and cooking and doing somebody else's laundry about three hours every day. So, um, and it's done, so I, they became, they're quite small, and now actually I'm making these really quite big paintings of the same thing. And I'm doing another series of the Virgin Mary having a hot flush on the Northern line when she's picking up Jesus from school. Because I kind of think also the stories that we don't tell, same idea that Judith was saying, and often I say, what are the stories of these biblical women we don't get to hear? And let me let me tell you what I think they might be. It might be Mary going, God, is it? I'm just hot. I'm hot, you know? And this is really uncomfortable and I shouldn't have worn this particular outfit. And this, these feelings, we, we're not following the women's, especially bodily experiences, and they're huge, the bodily experiences we have. You know, we're only wanted when we have a baby, but what happens when we baby doesn't work out? Or what happens when we don't bond with a baby? All that difficult stuff. Why, why, why can't we fill kind of texts and Jewish art with all of that? And I know um, Laura does a lot of work about motherhood as well. So, so, you know, it's really wonderful. As you know, your question was about where are you as an artist, Jewish artist? What's wonderful you find in life is you go out as what you are and then you meet people doing parallel journeys to you. And that's where the most exciting collaborations happen. So even though I come from my perhaps Jewish experience, although, you know, I'm also an artist separately, but the things that I'm trying to work out, I find other people on my journey and that makes it incredibly rich and exciting and far bigger than just my personal experience. You had your hand raised? I, yeah, I do. I, I, I'm struggling in my head to think about how to articulate it as a question rather than like a rambling something, which is, I suppose, what I'm thinking about myself and something in my PhD that I'm doing is about um, Jewish women. And I suppose I'm wondering, in the context of your work and your research, is there something formal? And stylistic that's unifying these women's works, it's, or is it subject matter exclusively? Is there, is there in the canon something also that is, yeah, stylistic? I don't think so. No. no, I couldn't say that at all. I think they've got nothing in common in many ways. And yet the thing they have in common is trying to talk about women's experiences mm -hmm. in ways that maybe comics is good at let, letting you do it. Remember. I always remember that it teaches that comics is incredibly democratic. You don't need to go to art school. You don't need a studio. You don't need a canvas or a paint. You go and get a piece of paper and a pen. You draw it. You photocopy it. You staple it together and you give it to a friend. And then you've self-published. 
And it's one of the very few art forms, you know, there are zine fairs and all these other ways of swapping work and you don't need permission and you don't need status and you don't need all these kind of access points. You can just do it. And I think that's why it's a wonderful art form and, and, and it kind of roof, it still relates very much to its kind of underground roots in that way. Um, that it can bring out voices that you'd find difficult to say in public or, you know, people often draw back coming out or embarrassing incidences or, or coming to terms with some medical issue they've had that they're not quite ready to publicly talk about yet on that quiet private piece of paper they can enact something for the first time or they can be angry at the system or angry at family or you know angry at re religious institutions in a way that maybe society would be less friendly to them but they can do it on the page so i'd say that's probably what people have in common more than anything else Yeah, I wanted to ask about the commercialization of the field. Um, is it um, how difficult is it to find publishers? How difficult is it to interest galleries or museums in this type of work? If you compare, you know, if you were writing books or if you were painting paintings, <laughs> and um, does um, I mean I don't know. I'm I'm not an artist, but I imagine that comics have been in the past been seen as a more commercialized type of art. Well, I think there's is, is that yeah. still good. And it serves itself better. Something. There's probably always there's two sides. There's what we talked about before about which is kind of underground comics, which is kind of in a way also like a, an, another world where you you know you you small you you publish yourself, you're publishing groups, that's how you do it. And then there's you know, there are not publishing houses that do just comics and some publishing houses that do a certain kind of comics. So um, I think I'm not really an expert. There are people who are more expert than me, but I what I do is when I teach, so I teach graphic narratives at the Royal Drawing School and I teach students to get together and self-publish a zine together. So they'll have like four or five pages and then together they have this like 40 page book that they get, get get an ISBN number, they can put it in the British Library, they can sell it at Gosh Comics, they can go to Zine Fairs. That's a whole way of getting yourself out there and seen and read, um, which which doesn't take for someone to like your work. That's you know always difficulty. Um, there are publishers, but you know sometimes when you're published you have to change things or something like that. So I think there's something really wonderful to remain independent in that. But yes, there are some people who they do, they get book, book deals and, and it all works out, but you don't always get enough to live on. And, and often people get grants to supplement whatever, you know, a, a advance they might get. So there definitely is a scene. But for most comics artists, they, you know, you have to, you have to hustle, you teach or something. And for yourself, it doesn't really, it's not in your mind when you design, and think and put the comic to paper, what will the audience think? Will it sell? No, I, I can't. I mean, when you make art, I think in in a way that makes sense to me, at least, all I have to think of is, does it ring true to me? You know, is it this thing I need to say? Do I have to put it out there? And then that's the only conversation I can have uh, at all. Anything else I've ever produced for anyone else has just been inauthentic and not felt good. So it's a, a, I think, I don't know how it feels for other artists in the room. Are there anyone else in the room? I know Laura's nodding. Anyone else? But it's a feeling you have to just do this thing so i think that it's a buzzing bee in my head and it's got to come out that's what it is there are lots of nice um comments in the chat um pray for your work um relating subject matter to two recent events um, in Israel. Um, someone who met uh, Miriam Katzin. Um, so that, that's lovely. Um, I, I don't know if we have any, any other um, questions, strictly speaking, um, in which case I can have a go at one. Because someone did mention, actually, uh, Teddy Abramovitz, who said, I really love the way there are so many references to art history images in your work. And that was what really struck me about all of the examples that you uh, spoke about is the layers of 
textual kind of textual visual relationality you have you know biblical women you have maybe the depictions of these women in the renaissance time um in some cases you have the events of the holocaust and then the representation of those events in the 70s i don't know uh, that relate them back all through all of these layers and is there something sorry is there something um that you think about the, the format of the comic that is particularly good at conveying these different um how would you say sort of inter interrelational yeah references between these different points in time and, and in, in art history and in in biblical history and history per se. Um, I, I suppose what comics has got is it's got text and image. So we're already we're already richer than any novel you're gonna get. You know what I mean? We can do all this stuff, which you know you can do, we can use the whole page. We um and also I suppose one thing I really feel very strongly about is comics is part of art history, you know, and and you know, Hogarth's work or um the Bayer Tapestry. I mean, it's all text image work that's graphic narratives. I'm not inventing. We're not suddenly turned up in the 1970s. I mean, it was going on all, all the way through. It just, it's just um, sometimes you have to remember that comics, whatever these things are that I show you, graphic narratives, whatever that, they can go in the art gallery alongside, you know, just saying like the Tate Feminist Art Exhibition. They could have got all these 1970s comics artists up there and put their work up and they would all have been saying the same thing as the installations, the performances and the films. They just didn't do it. For, I don't know, I haven't seen it yet, seen it next week. But uh, you know, that's, I think that's really important. So first of all, comics are in conversation with all these other art forms all the time. I think that in the same way, literature borrows, people borrow literature or they, they intertwine all, you know, bits of Shakespeare or Wordsworth and they reference them. So comics are just doing the same. It's kind of knitting and embroidering all these cultural references together to create something incredibly rich and layered. And I think that's part of this idea in life, really, we, we're we coming from something. So I come from a, a Northwest Jewish family and these are the references I have, but whatever world you come from, those are the visual, verbal, um, you know, musical references you have. So, you know, bring them all in, make, make the world work you make as rich as your history you've experienced and you know. So I think that's, as I said, I think that's something that comics can do. You, I could give you a lecture on comics and music and how music is intertwined in all these comics in various different ways. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I think it's, it's a hugely rich thing. And, and it's because it has this text image and has so much space on the page. It can play with that endlessly um, that it can do so much, as you're saying. Um, but again, I, I presume, I don't know, I guess, do, I don't know how much comics you read, but were you surprised that comics were doing this? This person was having a Satchio moment in a comic. I suppose I was surprised. It's not to say that I thought it was an inferior art form or anything like that, but it just the, yeah, the, the, the layers of text, I recall, in, 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 in those comics struck me as quite, yeah, I mean, you really have to know your stuff to kind of put all of that into uh into, into a, a work of graphic art so um, no, i was definitely impressed by that and i suppose sometimes though i think as a creative person doesn't always know they're doing it some of it's deliberate and some things you, you don't even know somehow i don't know if sharon Reed was thinking i'm going to tell a story through language but somehow it happened because maybe in real life she found her voice at the end and I'm, I've just found ways to unpick what she did on the page. I don't know if she sat up and said, "This is how I'm going to do it." Because sometimes creativity isn't something you organise; it mm. it flows out of you. And Miriam Caton said, "The graphic, her graphic novel, we honoured, came out like vomit from her, for her." Mm. You know, it was such a traumatic experience. She didn't even know all of it. You know, she hadn't even remembered it, but she knew something had happened, and it just came out, and you don't even know it. And there it is. Mm. And then other people have to unpack it for you. Yeah. I, I have one more question in a way, um, inspired by Joe's um, comment, but also thinking about um, about the images of um, women from classical paintings between candle bins or waiting for your dishwasher. Um, it's something incredibly cheeky you're doing. You're just snatching male images of women and you're putting them into your kitchen and. How, how does it feel to be so cheeky 
It's a very personal question. It's very nice. I, I think it's just, to me, all of this is just kind of, it's this powerful humor. Yeah, I think I think that's the way to go, actually. I think I found that people responded better to my work when I was funny and brightly coloured than if I was just angry and mean. <laughs> so, and you're saying exactly the same thing. You're just doing it in a way that people enjoy. And I was kind of amazed. Like, I, I sold a, a lot of the prints from this biblical domestic for charity. And, um, like, they're in, like, 100 people houses now. They've got these prints. And I'm so happy that my fury from COVID, the... The, the fact that I went back like 200 years in the feminist experience, I was just like a cleaning lady for like, I don't know, 12 months or whenever it was. That's, you know, I became that. My fury has become these beautiful prints in people's houses. How, you know, that's really, my fury could have been like me smashing down doors or, you know, throwing dishes. But no, I put it into beautiful art. So I think sometimes that's another wonderful thing about creativity is you can take the awful, the terrible, the traumatic, or just something that annoys you and makes something marvellous out of it that the world can enjoy. And we do have uh, another question on Zoom now. Uh, Sam says, in what ways did writing your story change your life? And will there be a book of Sarah part two at any point? Thank you. Um, so I think going from someone who wanted to do something and didn't believe she could and was waiting for someone to give her permission to do it doing a book was really important doing something I felt was unmanageable and managing it was very important to me I dreamed of having a book and I did it so that's like amazing so yes it did change my life I believed in myself actually and I believe that this life of this often depressed uh, unconfident person could could become a thing on someone's shelf. That's amazing. Um, so I kind of hope that would inspire people to believe that wherever they are on their creative journey, at whichever kind of embryonic stage, there's a stage where you want something and you cannot imagine it getting there. And actually it will get there, but you just you just have to keep working at it and eventually someone's gonna like it. You know, some and it will happen, but you just have to do it. Before anyone believes in you, you just have to do this thing. So that's so that would definitely change my life. Help me know that all creative journeys start with a kind of you know when God created the world, it was He said it was Tohu and Bohu, it was complete chaos, and then He got it together. And it's a bit like that creativity. You've just kind of got this thing and you end up doing it, and eventually it becomes something magnificent, like as good as the world, perhaps, or maybe just a book. But either way, you've done it. So that's really great. And um, is there a book of Sarah? I don't know book, no, book Sarah too, because I don't really know what I'm doing while I'm doing it. So I'm making these, these pictures. I've kind of written things. I have a PhD mono, monograph to write and I'm making these big paintings and I don't know what's gonna happen, but I'm really enjoying being on my journey because I know I've had experience that it works out. So I presume it's gonna work out again. That optimism. Um, very much. Are there any more questions from the audience? Well, in which case, I would like to thank Dr. Sarah Lyman again for a fascinating talk and a really stimulating discussion session. So, if you could join me.